A Brethren Quartet. Come and say it for us.
makes praise the Lord. That's it. Hallelujah. Let's sing that the last time that key and on when to say sing hallelujah. Remember that that means praise the Lord and let's lift them up in praise. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. He is alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive. Sing I'm praising the Lord. I'm praising the Lord. I'm praising the Lord. In everything that happens, I'm praising the Lord. I'm praising the Lord. I'm praising the Lord. In everything that happens, I'm praising the Lord. I'm praising the Lord. I'm praising the Lord. Praise the Lord, repeat the last phrase. In everything that happens, I praise the Lord. And then if we're really praising, truly praising the Lord, we want to let the Lord know we love Him. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the great privilege of 
coming to camp to have a great time and to have a good time of fellowship with with all our friends and, and people our own age. And Lord, we just thank you for this life that we live in America where we are free and we just have an abundance of everything we could imagine. And Lord, we, we come here this week to have a good time, but, but more importantly, we need to really grow close to you. And we pray that through the, the quartet and through Mr. Fullerton that your spirit would work with each team that's here and convict them where they need convicting and uh, sanctify those who need to be sanctified and reclaim those who need to be reclaimed. And just let this week be a time of, of deep spiritual progress for a number of teens. And Lord, just help us to realize through this week that, that life is, is short and it may seem like it's a long way off before we enter into the next world at our age right now, but it's going to come quicker than we think. And that if we don't live to our fullest, then we're going to regret it. And we just pray that you help us to get things nailed down now and help us to commit our lives to you. Lord, we just thank you for loving us, for loving us when we screw up and when we're disobedient, when, when we make you cry. We just thank you for loving us anyway. And we just pray that you help us to show our love for you and, and, to, and to bring a smile to your face through this week. Thank you for all you've done for us, and we just praise you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
ourselves a little bit better. Hey, yeah, we did that. No, oh, hey, 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 stop, 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 stop. stop guys. <laughs> I meant one at a time. It's, oh. it's a little easier that way. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm Jim Kramer. I'm from Oskaloosa, Iowa, and I'm a junior major in business. I'm John Brewer. I'm from Muncie, Indiana, and I'm a senior major in church music. I'm Rick Parks from Pittsfield, Illinois. And I'm a senior majoring in accounting. I'm Glenn Tucker from Valparaiso, Indiana. I'm a junior majoring in church music and Christian education. Hello, my name's Greg Hutchins. I'm from Springfield, Illinois. I'm a senior majoring in business administration. This time. 
The, uh, airplane engines here for just a moment. Fire really sounding great tonight. Thank you for being up there and sweating your little hearts out and bringing us that great music. Well, I grew up on this district many moons ago and sat where you sit tonight and Wendy Parsons was my camp director. Think of it, as old as I am. Wendy was my camp director back when I was a junior hijack on this district and that was like back in the 60s. <laughs> Many moons ago. And uh, we had all these uh, great Olympic games and stuff that went on, and softball throw and uh, all that stuff. And uh, it was a great time. And so when I come back to this campground, there's a lot of special memories that uh, kind of flood through my mind when I step on the Manville camp. And uh, that's one of the great things about the camping program in the Church of the Nazarene. Uh, you come each year and you renew some special relationships and friendships and you check out who's dating who and uh, who's broken up since last year's camp and uh, who's going where for college next year and all that kind of good stuff. All that, of course, right? Right. right. Yeah. And in the midst of all the good times and the crazy times and the athletics and the Bible studies and the the late nights and all the good stuff that happens at camp. Uh, God has a way of coming and meeting us here in this setting and really speaking to our hearts about what's going on, what he's dreaming for us, for each individual, the plan that he has for your life, what he would like for you to do with the life that he's given you. And so camp has become a very special time. And I hope that this week, and I really, I really believe, I've sensed it already, that this is going to be a very special week. Not because I'm here, because I'm the speaker or the brethren here are singing. It's because you're here and God is, is, is here. And uh, we're going to have a very special time. Because he's very interested in you. You see, Christianity has the potential of dying out within one generation. If one generation ceases to share the good news of the gospel with the next generation, we could pretty well close up shop within a generation's time. And there are a lot of 
older folks who are looking to you and to me and who are saying, you know, I'm just a little concerned that when I pass the baton off to these young people, are they gonna are they gonna have the stuff that it takes to live the committed Christian life in the midst of all the gunk and the garbage that is going on in our world? And when I see you sitting in the choir and, and singing the songs and the hymns of the church, and I see, I hope in part of what what God sees, the potential wrapped up in your life, I tell those older folks that we don't have anything to worry about because we've got a group of young people in the Church of Nazarene who are committed to following Jesus and to sharing His Spirit. And uh, the church is going to be in good hands. Next summer, let me put a plug in for Nazarene Youth Congress. There will be 4,000 Nazarene young people gathering on the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., for about nine days of equipping and sharing and growing and being challenged and being involved in some inner city work projects and it'll be a fantastic time once in a lifetime you have an opportunity to attend an Azure youth congress the district ny president will have application forms and this year the quota for each district is twice the size that it's ever been this is the largest youth congress that we've ever put on and uh, in our humble opinion it's going to be awesome and we hope that you're going to be there you won't want to miss it a lot of teens back in 83 who uh, weren't sure that they even would have a chance to go to Waxlipec for the last youth congress that we had uh, didn't even bother to apply. And uh, troops, you don't apply, there ain't no way you're going to go. You've got to apply. A small book has to be read, you'll have to appear before a selection committee, but there are twice the number of young people from each district in our denomination in North America who will be coming to NYC next summer. And so if you don't try, You'll never have a chance. So I really encourage you, uh, and every pastor that's here, and every youth worker, and every church that's represented, try out and read the book and appear before the committee. And we hope to see you next summer in Maryland for a very special time. You won't want to miss it. Well, talk about the memories. Let me give you just a brief history in my, of my own journey. I grew up in the uh, Ottawa First Church and uh, spent my years there and as I said, I grew up in this district and uh, this uh, tabernacle, I remember the tabernacle that was here before this one, the wooden one that was here. Um, and I remember people like Reverend Morrill who founded this camp and some other of the, other of the great leaders on this district. And uh, there are very special memories that have been uh, made at this altar on this campground and you are now part of another generation who are, are sharing in that and that's exciting. But when I was in high school, I was going through a time of uh, resistance to God because in, when I was 15 years old, my father passed away from cancer. And I shook my face in the face of God, and shook my, my fist in the face of God, and said, God, it's your fault. You took my father before. It was time. He was only 60. And my father and I were very, very close. And I, was, I grew very bitter from that experience. And for the years in high school, uh, I just kind of played the game of going to church to keep my mom happy. But inside there was a bitterness, there was a resentment toward God, and there was a desire to do my own thing. And I was going to live my life my own way. And I was going to just kind of play the game of being in church and being in Sunday school and giving all the right answers when I was asked questions in Sunday school class and being there for the revival services but digging my fingernails into the pew when I felt the convicting power of the Holy Spirit because I was just determined that I was going to do things my way. And through the graciousness of God, He allowed me to do that. You know, God never grabs you by the throat and yanks you and throws you down and says, Believe or die. He never does that, does he? He just lovingly compels you through the witness of faithful people and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and says, Come. Come and partake of the life that I have given you because of my death. Come and have peace. Come and have purpose for living. Don't get caught in just plain church in playing the game. And I'd like to talk to you about that a little bit tonight. Where's your heart? Jesus had a lot to say about hearts. The Bible has a lot to say about hearts. In one passage in Proverbs that talks about out of the heart flow the issues of life. And it's kind of uh, symbolic of all that we are and all that we will be. And uh, if you brought your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at this passage in verses 19 through 21, a familiar passage that you've probably heard 1,900 times since Vacation Bible School and Caravan and quizzing and everything else that you've been a part of. 
But it's a good passage, and I'd like to read that for you this evening. Matthew chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, Jesus had a lot to say about hearts, as I've said. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Have you ever been in a class where uh, your body was there, but your heart wasn't really there? You're like, you wanted to be someplace else, and your body was in that class, and uh, you were hearing some words, but it was like, boy, your mind and the heart was just somewhere else. It was out playing basketball, or it was out, you know, watching the tube, or it was out with somebody special. Your body was there in that classroom, but that was all. <laughs> you ever had that situation? No. Uh, that's you guys. I think we've all been there. Or have you ever known somebody who uh, was dating a guy or a girl, and uh, it looked like everything was cool, but it was like they had the hots for somebody else, you know? They were like together, but somebody, one of the two people's heart, just wasn't in the relationship. Have you ever seen anybody? No. no. Okay. Okay, I think I'll go back to Kansas City and... Uh, the best sermon I got. I think we uh, have seen people in those kinds of situations. People's bodies are there, but their hearts aren't in it. And uh, unfortunately, it can happen with our relationship with Jesus, too. In uh, John chapter 13, verse 37, it kind of happened to Peter. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. What? No way, man! I'm going to follow you wherever go, wherever you go, and I'm going to do whatever you want me to do, and I'm never going to deny you. I mean, every all the way with you. I mean, 100%. I'm cool. I'm going to make it. No problems. I'm with you. And Jesus said, no, Peter. You're going to deny, deny me three times. Oh, man. And that's the kind of cut Peter to the heart, because, you know, Peter was kind of the macho, macho man of the disciples, you know. He was kind of the little Joe Tuck guy, and he was going to make it. He was just going to muscle his way through, and wherever Jesus had to go, he'd do it. He'd dive off cliffs, whatever it took, Peter was going to be there. And Jesus said, no, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, uh, well, I don't like the sounds of that. And what happened? When the chips were on the line and when the pressure was on, and it looked like everything was falling apart, Peter checked out. And this little servant girl makes this macho man look like a real chump. And Peter denied his Lord. And then there was a rich young man who came to Jesus asking what he must do to get eternal life. And Jesus said to him, oh, obey all the commandments. And the rich young man came back and said, well, I've done that. I mean, I've followed the book and done all the good stuff. And I basically have done what you asked me to do. And uh, what else is there? I mean, what else do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, well, sell all you have and give it to the poor. Whoa. Now we're getting a little too close to home. You see, where his heart was, was in those spindolis, those bucks, those big savings accounts that he had stored up. And he, would, he had all the stuff on the outward side. He was living it by the book. But where his heart was, was in that checking account and in that bank money market. And when Jesus said, go sell all you have and give it to the poor, the guy's heart, where his heart was became very evident. Jesus knew where his heart was. And that's why he challenged him to give everything that he had and to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. And the story goes that the young man went away very sad because he said that he wanted to serve God and follow God, but his heart just wasn't in it. You see, when Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, he wasn't talking about this organ inside that pumps blood and, and it's all these ventricles and all this stuff that you study in biology and get ill over and all that. You know. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about something much, much more important. He was talking about a life. He was talking about your want-tos, your dreams, your commitments, your very life. And when Jesus says, come follow me, 
He wants you to put your heart into it. No reservations. 100% commitment. And what he was saying to Peter and what he was saying to the rich young man and what he's saying to us is that you've got to have your heart in it if you're really going to follow me. Here on earth, relationships don't work very well unless we have some commitment to them. A marriage relationship is pretty well goes down to two. If after the wedding ceremony and the saying of I do is done and then the communication stops and the loving and the caring stops, what happens to that relationship? We know what happens. And what happens, you know, what would happen if uh, one of you were selected to be on the Olympic team in 1988? And you really worked hard, and uh, you had made the Olympic trials, and you were out in Denver, and you were selected to represent the United States in the Olympics. And so, hey, you made it, and you were on the Olympic team, and all of a sudden you just kind of stopped training. Or what, happened to, or what would happen to that re marriage relationship when you tie the knot, and you put on the ring, and then you stop communicating? You see, there is a point of beginning, but then there is a life for the living. Where would your heart you say, well, that sounds pretty stupid. What, you know, what after would do that and make the Olympic team and, and quit training? That's pretty stupid. But that's what a lot of Christians do when they just play church and just play the game and show up on Sundays, but then just kind of put their Bible on the shelf the rest of the week and their God talk on the shelf the rest of the week and their God actions on the shelf for the rest of the week and live like everyone else. You see, there's a point of beginning but there's a life for the living. And young people, we've got enough revolving door Christians in our churches. We don't need any more. People who go in the door of commitment and come right back out when something comes up, they just kind of check out a relationship. They make a commitment and the revival's over, and two weeks later, they're right back living like they did. You see, Jesus is looking for some people who are willing to be totally committed, who are taking seriously the claims of the gospel, and who will make whatever changes need to be made in order to follow him. And we've got the game plan right here in this book. And the exciting news, the good news, is that when I read the end, it says we win. Isn't that great? This morning I was in a funeral service in my home church for Reverend Milton Johnson. Most of you don't know him, but he's uh, been a minister in this district for a number of years. He uh, personified commitment. And... Uh, it was just a time, you know, the contrast to my own mind, what I'm thinking of right now, I'm in a funeral room this morning, and tonight I'm speaking to a bunch of young people, and it's like bookends of a life and the potential that you have right here, and a life at the end of the line, and the eternity, the promise of eternal reward here, and I've seen both. And there was Dr. G.B. Williamson, the former general superintendent, in his last few days before he passed away, said, he was sitting and looking out the window, and his wife said, GB, why are you looking so reflective? I mean, what's going on in that mind of, your, of yours? And he said, you know, honey, I'm sitting here, and I have this overwhelming feeling that God is very pleased with the way I've lived my life. Boy, when I come to the end of the road in my own journey, I want to be able to say, you know, I just really feel like God's pleased with the way I've lived my life. And I can't do that in my own strength, and neither can you. I tried for a time, and many people tried for a time. And unfortunately, far too many people accumulate far too many scars, or worse than that, lose their life totally before they realize the difference that Jesus can make. And all we have to do is read, read the newspaper and check out guys like Lynn Bias and Rogers and some other athletes who get a lot of press, get a lot of attention, but they have it all in the world's terminology and understanding of success. But suddenly a life is snuffed out because they're not committed to Christ. And the artificial high from drugs seems to me more meaningful than a life with Jesus. What are we talking about? This whole week we're going to be talking about heart conditions. Not that you've got too much uh, stuff in your ventricles and that you've got uh, too high a cholesterol count, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a total commitment of your want-tos, of your very life, of all that you are and all that's wrapped up in you and all your talents and skills and everything that God's given. And we're going to be talking about how God wants that 100%.
this time to leave this youth camp and to go back and to live like you made that 100% commitment. When you go back to the high school hallways, and you go back to the, to the teams and to the band and the choir and all your other activities and to your local church youth group, that you'll go back and make a difference in your family, in homes that are broken by divorce, that are struggling because of financial problems, and all the other hassles that your own family may be facing in these days, you can make a difference with Jesus' help, but your heart's got to be in this thing called Christianity. If it's, it's, if it's not, it won't mean much. And it won't be all that God dreamed it could be when he asked his son Jesus to die on a cross for you and me. In closing tonight, I'm not going to open the altar for an altar call, but I would like to do this, and I do this at camps wherever I go. On the first night of a camp, I always like to ask everyone to just come down and stand around the altar, and I pray just to kind of a closing opening prayer, closing for this particular service, but yet opening for this week of camp, because God wants to do something very special for you this week. It's no accident that you're here. And as we come to the services and Bible study times and all the great fun times with the team sports and all the other good stuff that Wendy has planned and the counselors are working on. As we come to those times, <coughs> God's going to make us very special. But I like at the first evening and the first service to commit the entire week to God and saying, Lord, help us to have, first of all, open hearts that you'll help us to listen to what you're, what you're really wanting to say to <coughs> To me, individually, <coughs> excuse me. And so, in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask our quartet, uh, Enos, if you will play. <coughs> excuse me, losing my voice. You will play "Shoe His Spirit." <coughs> Yelling too much old basketball. Now, so. <coughs> and if you would stand. And just come around this, these altars, and if you would like to, we can hold hands and just uh, join our hearts. This is a very special time this week. You're not joining the Church of the Nazarene, you're not making a profession of faith or any commitment. You were just saying by our presence around this altar that, God, I'm open to what you have for me this week. I want to be available. I want to be listening to your Holy Spirit.